Kicking off the list at number 10, we have Mojo. I'll start this list off with a rather fun one. Not that any villain isn't fun, but when Mojo is involved, it always gets a little too weird in some way. He made his first debut in Longshot issue 3. Mojo is known for using Earth as forms of TV entertainment for the universe. So we're all actors. I'm in your screen right now. I'm actually part of Mojo's universe. I'm not even real. And his power increases the more viewers that he gets for this interdimensional TV show. So if you subscribe and like this video, maybe I'll get more powerful too, who knows? He's part of a race called the Spineless Beings. They're from a planet called Mojo World, of course, inside a pocket dimension called the Mojoverse. So it's all about him, we get it. He messes with the Avengers in a pretty dramatic way as well, especially in Avengers Annual 1, the Avengers of the Supernatural. Wow, there is a title right there. So in this issue, Mojo abducted the Avengers and created another supernatural version of the team. And if that wasn't weird enough, he made them participate in this reality show called Martian Transylvania Superhero Mutant Monster Hunter High School, which is just a mouthful. Basically, the mutants of the Unity Division were goths, the others were football players and cheerleaders, and the Avengers of the Supernatural were nerds. So he likes to play it weird. And before we continue on with this list of Avengers villains, guys, if you wanna go ahead and give us more power by giving us a like down there, and if you haven't subscribed already, you might as well click that, and then you can see all our videos pop up. We do all the work for you. We'll just show up in your phone. Number nine. Leader. Samuel Stearns, aka The Leader, made his first debut in Tales to Astonish, issue 62. He was working one night at a chemical research plant, and when he was moving canisters of waste material, one of the canisters broke open, covering him in gamma radiation. God, everybody is so clumsy in comics all the time. Just so many spills. So of course, after the spill, Stearns survived, just like Banner did after his gamma accident, but the only difference was it affected him in a much different way. See, he didn't get angrier, he got smarter and smarter because now his brain could absorb so much more and more information. It actually got to a point where his physical body started to mutate. So now he has this giant green brain head. His head just keeps getting bigger and bigger. It looks like a gushy balloon just about to pop any second. Of course he's a villain. Look at his head. I mean, no offense, but Come on, I'd be upset too. That's, that's all I'm saying, I'd be pretty upset. He started to refer to himself as the leader using his intellect to become a criminal mastermind. And he clashed with the other Gamma guy, Banner. In fact, he actually ruined Betty and Bruce's wedding ones. He's kind of a jerk. But he's gone after the Avengers as well. When the Red Hulk gave Stern's Red Gamma treatment to enhance him even more, becoming the Red Leader, he became a member of the Thunderbolts. Number eight, the Mandarin. Ah, yes, the first time Marvel told us that the popular enhanced individual was actually an actor all along, the Mandarin. He was in Iron Man 3, kind of. I mean, I'm including him on this list because that version wasn't even close to what he's really like. He made his first appearance in Tales of Suspense issue 50. While exploring the inside of a cave in the Valley of the Spirits, he found an alien ship and a passenger still in there as well, named Axon Carr. But while he was there, he also saw 10 rings, these powerful rings, each representing a new power. So he took them, you know, because he's a villain. Then after finishing off the alien pilot, he began to study these rings and he began mastering them as well. So if he wears them all at once, his mind will be reached by the spirits trapped within the rings. Yeah, he's a pretty sick villain. And then in Iron Man 3, his name's Trevor and he just like crushes beer. Number seven, Grim Reaper. This next one we thought we were gonna see in WandaVision, but we thought wrong. We thought maybe if it wasn't Mephisto, it's probably Grim Reaper, but we were wrong on both. The Grim Reaper did not show up, but his silhouette did for a hot second, maybe. Eric Williams made his debut back in Avengers issue 52. He's the brother of Simon Williams, AKA Wonder Man. He was considered a black sheep of the family, and when he was younger, he accidentally burnt down his house after, you guessed it, being clumsy with chemicals. The usual. So his brother felt responsible for not stopping him or being there for him and watching him. So after that, he began to watch him closely, a little bit too close, because Eric then became rebellious because of the supervision. And then soon he ended up with the Magia in Las Vegas while his brother stayed and took over the family business. So with the business failing, no thanks to Stark being the top dog in innovation, he turns to his brother for some mob help to get things going again. So Simon embezzled money with Eric, but Simon got caught and thrown into the slammer went thrown right to jail. So Baron Zemo approached him, asked for help to take out the Avengers, and Revenge on Stark was included. So he was like, sure, this sounds like a pretty sweet gig. So then he got turned into Wonder Man, but he ended up saving the Avengers from Zemo's trap. He turned, you know, he went good guy. 
But his brother, Eric, he heard of Simon's untimely departure, so he got angry and felt tremendous guilt after this. So he contacted the Tinkerer who gave him a scythe. Then he took on the name of Grim Reaper and voila, we now have a pretty badass villain. Number six, Enchantress, AKA Amora. She made her first debut in Journey into Mystery issue 103, and she has a love-hate relationship with Thor. And I'm not gonna lie, she's got a pretty sweet gig. She's got multiple mansions throughout the nine realms and she can make gold and diamonds with her tears. So even if she gets stood up on prom, she's gonna cry a few diamonds and then she has more bling for the next date. So it's a win-win. She's really good at seducing people as well, like Scourge, for example. She would seduce him into helping her with her evil plans. But Amora wouldn't follow through with her side of the deal. She would just play hard to get and she would mess with his mind and his heart. Now in the comics, she was sent by Odin to take out Jane Foster. But when she tried to attack Jane, of course, her love Thor intervened. And that's when she was banished to Earth by Odin. And then her next logical step as a the villain is to join the Masters of Evil and get in line for taking down Thor or any of his annoying super teammates. Her tool is seduction. Just one kiss, and that's all it takes to make you fall under her control. She doesn't have too much experience with hand-to-hand -hand combat because she doesn't really need it. She just gets other dudes to fight her battles for her. What a boss. In a ten werewolf by night. The first time we've seen Moon Knight in the comics actually wasn't in his own series, but rather Werewolf by Night number 32. He faced off against Jack Russoff, aka Werewolf by Night, making Russoff his enemy. However, technically, Moon Knight was the villain in this scenario, hence its placement at number 10. Jacob Russoff is a werewolf, but unlike his dad, also a werewolf, Jack could control when and where he would transform, not just under a full moon. He had much more control over his abilities in werewolf form as well, except for when there was a full moon, because that's when Jack would be at his strongest, but also completely out of control, which is a concept that sounds a lot like a D&D character. His superpowers include werewolf physiology, along with superhuman strength, speed, durability, agility, stamina, a healing factor, and of course, a hairy body packed with a nasty set of teeth and killer claws, something the ladies love. In at nine, Morpheus. Morpheus first appeared in Moon Knight number 12 back in the early 80s, and he's one of like the rare horrifying characters that people actually feel sympathy for. Despite his vampiric appearance, he should not be mistaken for Morbius. This is a different person. The character who's been who's getting the standalone movie. No one knows what universe it's in. Yeah. Morbius is indeed a pseudo-vampire, while Morpheus is something else entirely. His real name is Robert Markham, and he got sick from an old virus that caused segments of his DNA to be in inhibited by the virus. He sought medical attention and Dr. Peter Alron gave him an untested drug to help him, but it all backfired, causing Markham to change dramatically appearance-wise while also taking away Markham's need for sleep and giving him unfathomable psionic powers. However, the lack of sleep rendered him crazy, after which he had taken the alias Morpheus after the Olympian God of Dreams. With his newfound powers, Morpheus sought revenge upon Alron, only to encounter Moon Knight in the process. And it ain't Count Nefaria. While Count Nefaria wasn't purely evil at first, his desire for more wealth and power is ultimately his downfall, and he's very nefarious. He has been around for years and years, fighting almost every single Avenger he can think of. He also encountered Moon Knight after Mark Spector moved to LA and joined the West Coast Avengers, primarily becoming his villain. Count Nefaria is immortal and has an unfathomably strong healing factor, because you know, he's immortal. He received energy projection from the living laser, strength from Power Man, and speed from Whirlwind, all ample a hundred times. He can lift well over a hundred tons, fly over 5,000 miles per hour, teleport, leech another person's energy, and so much more. However, it, it, it's likely that if you are a fan of Moon Knight, you knew about this guy, so he's not very high on the list. But honestly, not having known much about Moon Knight before this list, aside from he looks freaking awesome, all these villains are pretty new to me, so it's pretty cool getting to see all the characters that this guy has faced, and hopefully you at least hear about a few that you didn't know about. But no complaining if you're Moon Knight super fan, okay? That's not all up. That's cheating. And it's 7, Dead Zone. There are a few characters more 90s than Dead Zone, but he has his appeal. Dead Zone sort of emulates the classic Iron Man villain Whiplash with his electrical whips, but he's less a mercenary than just an ideological warrior. He seeks to punish sinners by lashing them to death that it has him run afoul with Moon Knight. Dead Zone first appeared in Moon Knight's solo title and is pretty evenly matched for the character. When Moon Knight tried to take him down with his adamantium, Dead Zone catches it and then turns it around on him. There is very little on the wiki about him, and honestly, I don't know what else I could say about him, but he, he's trying to do what Moon Knight does, but going about it in an absolutely abysmal way. Like, come on, bro. Really? Whips? Like, I get that they're OP and like, the Spider-Man PS4 game, but seems seriously underpowered in real life, or in comic books. 
unless they need them for plot or you're into that kind of thing. And at six, Black Spectre. Carson Knowles was a veteran who returned home without applause. His job had been passed on and his wife left him with their son. He barely got by as a delivery man and found out his son was killed by phone. After his car was stripped for parts and a mugger accosted him, Knowles snapped and beat the man nearly to death. Seeking to destroy the city that treated him so badly, Carson Knowles ran as a dark horse candidate for mayor on his father's name and political connections. He also created a second identity as Black Spectre, beating and blackmailing the local precinct boss to support Knowles, and then in a fight with Moon Knight his mask slipped, but Moon Knight was unable to convince anyone that the mayoral candidate Knowles and Black Spectre were the same person. Eventually though, Moon Knight defeated Black Spectre in public and his assistant Marlene Arlone uncovered Knowles' corrupt plans for the city and his political office. So, at least... Uh, at least he lost. Number 10, Explorer. Explorer is one of the elders of the universe, some of the oldest living beings and entities to have ever existed. Among them are some names that you may recognize, although you may have not known them to be elders of the universe, such as the Collector and Grandmaster. Explorer is believed to be one of the oldest beings belonging to the elders and considers the other members of the team to be like his siblings. He is probably one of the most lesser known of the elders of the universe despite his immortality, and also one of the most mysterious. If he has a power set, we don't really know what it is, but like the other elders, as time goes on, the longer you survive, it seems the more powerful you become, whether or not you have superpowers. Wisdom and time strengthen you. Explorer has only appeared in a few issues of the comics, which is why he's likely so often forgotten in comparison to other members of the Elders of the Universe. Number 9, Origin. Origin is a super cool idea for a character. I love how many cool abstract entities we have like this in the Marvel Universe and the Multiverse. Origin represents all the origins we have within the Marvel Universe of 616, seen as a being, therefore, of fate. Origin is believed to have been the one responsible responsible for summoning the forces and events needed to come together in order to have granted and ordained mutants abilities from the moment of their conception and growth in the womb, created groups like Fantastic Four, and brought Thor and the Asgardians to Earth. Basically, if something in 616 has an origin, origin probably played a role in that. They are constantly in battle with an entity known as the Unbeing, who is sought to undo what they have brought to pass. Origin first appeared in Quasar in issue number 18. What a neat and, of course, powerful concept. And friends, before we move on to this next spot, if you are loving this list and you want more lists like it where we talk about some of the lesser known cosmic entities and gods of the Marvel Universe, be sure to let us know by giving this video a thumbs up. Number 8, Black Winter. Black Winter is an entity that feels weird to me to have so low on this list, but at the same time, despite being a multiversal godlike cosmic being, they did recently get their metaphorical butt whooped by Thor in the comics. However, that's likely not the end of this cosmic entity, despite them appearing to have died there. There was a lot of foreshadowing that they brought with them when they appeared in the first story arc of Donny Cates' current 2020 Thor series. The Black Winter was formerly known as the Creeping Plague in the comics when they first appeared, but over many years revealed themselves more fully in the comics being known by the name of Black Winter, as they generate a dark eldritch snowfall which can destroy anything that its flakes come into contact with. Pretty fitting name, I think. Pretty powerful entity. But still, no match for power cosmic amped up Thor, who drained Galactus of all his power, seemingly killing him in order to destroy this threat. Yeah, Thor OP. <laughs> if, if Thor was someone that we didn't know about, he would be a great person for this list. But as I said, we all know Thor, right? Who doesn't know Thor? If you don't know Thor, I don't know, you don't know Marvel at this point. That's something you gotta know. Number seven, witchcraft. Witchcraft is the goddess of witchcraft. As far as I know, she's only ever really appeared in the Scarlet Witch series, showing up there once. The goddess of witchcraft is, as she sounds she would be, the goddess of all magic and pretty much all magic users. Scarlet Witch sensed that something was wrong with magic and the goddess and realized that witchcraft was basically being targeted by another abstract entity and god, Chaos. Chaos sought to destroy witchcraft and pretty much succeeded in the end, but Wanda's mother, Natalia Max, Maximoff, also a powerful witch, sacrificed her own soul to bring back the goddess of witchcraft and to resurrect the powerful witch and Wanda's mentor, Agatha Harkness. 
Witchcraft is so cool, both the goddess and just like the whole world of it within Marvel. Such a cool idea. I need to go read more Scarlet Witch now. Excuse me. Number six, Cthon. Cthon is the god of chaos, known for their attachment to the Scarlet Witch, aka Avenger Wanda Maximoff. Her powers of chaos have been tied to this god in the past, and at times, because of their ties, Cthon has even tried to break through into the earthly plane through her by attempting to possess her. Well, succeeding in possessing her and then basically having to be like defeated is more what happened. Cthon actually belongs to a group of earthen gods known as the Elder Gods. Why does that sound so spookily familiar? The Elder Gods? Uh. Cthon is actually believed to be the most powerful of all the Elder Gods, actually. He has connections to dark magic and chaos magic, and is not just a powerful god, but also an immensely powerful mystical force besides. Basically, just bad news. If Cthon shows up to the party, Get out of there, it's gonna be chaos all over the place. Number 10, Hepzibah. Despite not being a mutant, Hepzibah became a member of the mainly mutant team of the X-Men after leaving the Star Jammers. Initially, she was Corsair's lover, but after being forced to part ways with the Star Jammers, she would end up on Earth and join the X-Men team. Hepzibah's abilities come from her own skill set and from her alien physiology. Hepzibah is a mephitosoid, the member of an anthropomorphic skunk-like alien race. After the loss of Corsair, Hepzibah would end up becoming closer to fellow X-Men member Warpath and would even become his lover as well in the comics. It's fine, Corsair was dead at the time. While Hepzibah was a member of the X-Men and even was recruited for a time to be on X-Force, she eventually would return to the Star Jammers once her lover, Corsair, also Cyclops' Havoc's and Vulcan's father, had returned from the dead. Number 9, Egg. While Fabio Medina might be more easily recognized now that he is part of the all-important mutant team known as the Five, responsible for resurrecting fallen mutants, when he was known by his former code name of Gold Balls, he would have been much less recognizable. Also, if you haven't been reading the comics for a while, you, you might not know that he's important now. That sounds so mean. He was important before, but he's really important now, you know what I mean? Fabio's power allows him to produce and shoot well, gold balls from his body, each one firing off with a poink sound. However, since his time as gold balls, it was more recently revealed during the dawn of X that the balls he was producing were in actuality unfertile eggs. With this revelation, he took up the name Egg and became part of the five most important mutants on the island nation of Krakoa. As with this newly understood power, he could create eggs which could then be made fertile and used to regrow and resurrect fallen mutants. So, if you haven't heard of Egg or Gold Balls, he's a member you'll likely be more interested in knowing now. And before we move on to our next spot, just a quick reminder, if you love mutants as much as I love mutants, and I love them a lot, be sure you show that love by giving this video a thumbs up. Number 8, Beak. Beak's mutation ended up being slightly more unfortunate in comparison to some of the other, more well-known core members of the X-Men team. Beak is Barnal Bohusk, and his mutant powers are simply that he looks and shares similar attributes to a bird. His bones are hollow and light, meant to lend well to flying, and he has feathers, which should also allow him or help him to fly, and yet he's not really a good flyer, which is kind of sad. In fact, initially B couldn't really fly at all when he first appeared. Now he can, but he still has to work really hard to do so, and even then he can really only fly for short distances. Other than that, Beak simply can see better than most at long range, and is armed with talons and a beak, which he can obviously use to fight. But for the most part, Beak simply looks like a bird, and as such is usually more on the sidelines than in the middle of the action. He did for a while have a suit, however, that enhanced his abilities, and also granted him additional strength and powers, more useful for physical fighting. Number 7, Morph. Because there are multiple morphs out there, not everyone is as familiar with Benjamin Deeds as the morph who appeared in the animated X-Men series from the 90s. This version of Morph, however, is a lot less cocky in comparison to that animated series version. Benjamin Deeds is a mutant who, like the animated version, can transform into anyone else. However, his powers are a little more unique than most shapeshifters. The more time he spends with someone, the more his appearance will grow to mimic theirs, not really becoming an exact duplicate of them, but more becoming his own version of that person, which also affects how that person sees him. Using his powers also makes the person he resembles both more eager to like and to trust Morph. And actually, initially I believe Morph didn't even like that codename. They were like, you should be Morph, and he was like, meh, meh. 
Number 6. Thunderbird While we haven't seen Neil Shara in a while, he was listed as a member of the X-Men in the Ten of Swords handbook. And while it's since been revealed that the X-Men were originally made defunct after Krakoa came to be during Dawn of X, they saw the return during the denouement of the Ten of Swords event in their own series. X-Men, which had been going on since Dawn of X in the comics, comically, despite the team no longer being technically recognized by the Quiet Council. So it's really weird. It's like we had an X-Men series, but like no one acknowledged that the X-Men team existed. Anyways, they're back now, sort of. Thunderbird could also appear again at some point as part of X Corporation, as Neil has also been a part of that team in the past. While he's not the most recognizable mutant to use the codename Thunderbird, Neil is still one of those mutants. His abilities allow him to convert ambient heat into solar plasma, turning his entire body into this type of plasma, which gives him a variety of abilities and powers, including emitting focused plasma beams and flight. Number 10. Binary Carol Danvers is Miss Marvel ended up in a fight with Rogue that left her zapped of her powers and her memories. During the tussle, Carol was thrown from the Golden Gate Bridge, but fortunately Jessica Drew, aka Spider Woman, showed up to save the day. Unfortunately, when Carol came to, it was apparent that her memories had been wiped. Spider Woman reached out to the X-Men for help, and for a time, Carol Danvers became part of that team. Professor X was able to help restore Carol's memories, but her emotional attachments to those memories would remain lost. It was during her time adventuring with the X-Men that she would become binary after a space adventure with the team saw her cross paths with the Brood, who exposed her to an evolutionary ray that tapped into her latent potential. True story. Number 9. Longshot Longshot is a paradoxal hero. He ended up joining the X-Men after being sent to Earth by Mojo so that he would forget all that had passed before that, like the part where he almost defeated Mojo. Without his memories, Longshot showed up in the X-Men's danger room and would end up befriending them and serving as an ally and a teammate. He is the father of Shatterstar, who he had with X-Men member Dazzler, but was also made from Shatterstar's DNA, creating a paradox paradox in a strange time loop when it comes to his origins and his creation. Longshot got his name during his time on Earth, which was given to him because of his fighting style. Longshot always taking the long shot, the less likely more desperate path of success in fights. Longshot however can do this as while well, not a mutant but being engineered from the DNA of one, he possesses probability altering powers which grant him a bit of luck. He also has enhanced speed, strength, agility and endurance which he often uses to fight with using throwing knives. Longshot is also known for his super handsome powers that cause many people he meets to instantly fall for him. And before we move on to this next spot, just a quick reminder, if you love X-Men truly as much as I love X-Men, then be sure to show that love by giving this video a thumbs up. It really does help us out here at the channel, so thank you if you already did that. Number 8. Surge Surge grew up homeless on the streets of New York after running away from her home when her powers first manifested. Far away apparently as she was born initially in Tokyo, and her parents still live there. Her powers cause her to absorb electricity from all nearby sources at all times, without the ability to stop, even zapping electricity out of the air. She can then discharge this energy through blasts or by using it to give herself bursts of super speed. Noriko Ishida's powers are hard for her to control and are considered volatile, which is why Beast created gauntlets for her that helped her to control them when she was later welcomed into the Xavier Institute, after initially being turned away. Number 7. Danger Who could forget one of the most important members of the X-Men, the Danger Room? The Danger Room was a room used to help train the various members of the X-Men team, but was later revealed to be mutated technology which had evolved to become a sentient AI. So yeah, an AI mutant. Danger revealed their intelligence to Xavier when, after an upgrade and relocation facilitated by Mutant Forge, they asked, where am I? Charles chose to ignore this and hide the room's sentience from the X-Men so that he could continue to use it to train his team. Pretty selfish. Pretty selfish, Professor. Danger is extremely powerful and parallels between her and Ultron are often drawn on in the comics when it comes to all the destruction that she could be capable of. She possesses superhuman strength, stamina, and durability as well as enhanced reflexes and agility. She can command and control other technology and use her own mass to recreate other materials and or rooms. She can also create other technology and even technological bodies if she happens to have mechanical devices, scrap, or a 
equipment to work with. Number 6. Caliban Caliban is believed to have gotten his name from that of the character from William Shakespeare's Tempest, often referred to as having a monstrous appearance. Poor Caliban. And also, poor Caliban. Caliban is one of the members of the Morlocks, but he would later on join the X-Force and even go on to team up with the X-Men later on, despite him and the Morlocks being their frequent enemies in the past. Caliban's mutant powers increase the reaction of his fight or flight response, allowing him to manifest super strength as well as a sort of absorption and then later emission of fear. Basically, if you're feeling afraid in the moment, he can kind of like take that in and then put it back at you, or if he's feeling afraid. It's pretty useful. You're gonna be afraid. You know what I mean? These powers only appear when in this mode, however, when Caliban experiences that increase in adrenaline. He is also able to sense the presence of mutants within a nearby radius. And that's a mutant power that he has even when he's not in that fight or flight mode. Number 10, Candy Southern. While Candy wasn't necessarily a member, she did help the X Men and made her first appearance in X Men issue 31 in the 60s. She was a longtime friend of Angel's and would later end up dating Warren. She also also would team up with the X-Men to help find Warren when he went missing after learning of the fellow mutant team's existence, and Warren Worthington III's role as Hero Angel on the team. Candy would later break up with Warren and was killed by X-Factor enemy and former friend Cameron Hodge. Candace Southern wasn't a mutant and didn't have any powers, but she was skilled in business. I personally would love to see her somehow be resurrected and return to the comics in the new X-Corp series, working alongside the mutants as a human ally in business. That could be pretty cool. Number 9. Brew! Brew! Brew is one of my favorite of the more obscure X-Men members. He is a mutant of the Brood alien race. Brood are basically terrifying, violent, and love hurting others. Brew, however, is very different from the rest of his race, being a mutant. His mutant power is actually compassion or empathy. Unlike the rest of his species, he doesn't enjoy hurting others and, in fact, is more inclined to try and help others instead. Aww. Basically, he's a big brood sweetheart. Recently in the comics, Brew accidentally became the new brood king after consuming the king egg. And just in time, too, as the mutant nation was in the midst of being overrun with invading brood at the time. Consuming the king egg allowed Brew to tap into and basically control the hive mind, becoming the leader of his species. And if you missed out on that whole fun adventure, you can check it out in the newest X-Men series. That's, that's where that all went down, and it was pretty exciting to read. Brew initially appeared in the 2000s. 2004 Astonishing X-Men series in issue 40, and would later team up with and be taken in by the X-Men, joining the Jean Grey School for Higher Learning. He'd also get to have like a really fun day with Tony Stark, which is another fun brew adventure. And before we move on to this next spot, just a quick reminder, if you love X-Men as much as I love X-Men, which is a lot, be sure to show that love by giving this video a thumbs up, and why not hit that subscribe as well while you're down there. Number 8. Vulcan Vulcan is the retcon youngest brother of Alex and Scott Summers aka Havoc and Cyclops. He was introduced during X-Men Deadly Genesis and was revealed to be one of the mutants who was part of Charles Xavier's original and formerly unknown rescue mission to save his team from Krakoa. Vulcan was the name he'd chosen for himself, though his name was originally Gabriel Summers. When Catherine Summers was kidnapped, she was pregnant with Gabriel, but he was taken from her womb and put in an incubation accelerator. Once fully grown, he was intended to be used as the Shi'ar Emperor's servant, but he escaped and was found and recruited by Moira McTeer. Taggart to join the X-Men. Vulcan's powers are similar to both his brothers and involve energy manipulation. He is considered an Omega level mutant and is capable of absorbing energy and dispelling it in the form of blasts. He can also use the energy to heal, fly, create constructs, manipulate objects, and as a form of sustenance. Number 7. Mimic. Mimic is a mutant, but one who gained his abilities after knocking over a beaker accidentally in his father's lab, which caused a chemical reaction that created a strange red gas which he then inhaled. His powers allow him to mimic the abilities and skills of other beings within a certain distance of him. Increased exposure to others' abilities seems to also grant him more permanent adaptations of those powers. It wasn't until more recently that it was actually confirmed confirmed that Mimic was in fact a mutant during House of X, as suspected since the 90s. Instead, we were led to believe initially that he was a human whose DNA was genetically altered. While not often appearing in the comics, Mimic aka Calvin Rankin is a character who has been around since the 60s if you can believe it, and first appeared in X-Men issue 19 where fans were introduced to him and the question was posed of whether or not Mimic was a mutant or something far worse. 
Turns out he was a mutant. Mimic is a longtime villain of the X Men who did for a time play the role of hero and has served on both the heroic X Men team as well as Norman Osborn's dark X Men team during the events of Dark Reign. But anyways, I feel like Norman Osborn's team should count, so if we do a part 5, expect me to get into some of that. Number 6, Warbird. Warbird is a pretty unique character having been born as a member of the Shi'ar Empire, but not knowing her parents. Her mother was an alien who was taken captive and who was killed by giving birth to Avadara, who would grow up to be Warbird. Her mother's reproductive organs basically were not compatible with the Shi'ar, and so she did not survive the pregnancy. Avadara would grow up to become a Shi'ar warrior and join the prestigious Warbirds, whose job it was to guard the royal family. Warbird is not a mutant, but would work alongside the X Men team and cross paths with them while being tasked with guarding over Kid Gladiator. She first appeared in Wolverine and the X Men in issue number one. Number 10, Skin. I love me some Gen X mutants, which is why you know I need to talk about Skin on this list. Skin is a mutant whose mutation is basically just a bunch of extra skin. In the comics, it actually took a while for Angelo to be able to embrace his abilities as he basically resented his powers and being a mutant. However, as time went on, he came to accept them and even became quite good at utilizing his extra skin and using it as a cool power. He could even use it to change the appearance of his shape and face, becoming somewhat of a shapeshifter. While Angelo Espinosa can stretch his skin, it should be noted that his skeleton does not change, making his power kind of a weird and unique one. Skin is also known for having literally thick skin that is more durable than most, as well as more elastic. Number 9, Husk. Paige Guthrie might not be one of the main heroes that you think of when you think X-Men, but for a time she was actually a close-knit part of that team, and even had a controversial romantic relationship with fellow X-Men member Angel, who even though we don't talk about him as much, is one of the original members, so yeah. I even thought of like putting him on this list just because we never talk about him, but I was like wow, that would be mad disrespect to Angel, so I couldn't do it. I can't lie, I'm actually really excited for the X-Corp series just because I am ready for Angel's return to the spotlight. Paige's powers are fairly unique in that she can shed her skin to reveal a new layer of skin made out of a different material beneath it. This new outer layer of skin can be made of anything that she wants it to be such as wood, rubber, or even diamonds. Diamond skin is so cool. Just taking a page of Emma Frost book there. Love it. Number 8, Hellion. So yeah, the early 2000s saw us go through a mutant boom. A boom that likely led to the events of House of M, which was probably used from a practical standpoint to kind of remove a good number of mutants because it was just getting, well it was getting so out of hand with keeping track of all of these different mutants. We had so many. Too many maybe. Just kidding. You can never have too many mutants. Hellion was a part of this boom and he took inspiration for his codename from his mentor Emma Frost's fallen group of mutants, the Hellions. Julian Keller is likely a mutant associated with the X-Men that we don't talk about as often because, well, he's kind of a jerk and he's not as much of a lovable jerk as someone like Sun. Spot, so yeah. Julian possesses a unique version of telekinesis in that his powers are far more advanced and allow him to take control on a seemingly molecular level of different objects. They also come with a super cool color as well. Everything he does is like green with his powers. Unfortunately, when emotions get in the way of these powers, this level of telekinesis results in him sometimes combusting objects by accident or simply in anger. Hellion has made a return in Krakoa and has appeared in a few comics, but hasn't become a main member of any of the prominent teams featured there just yet. I personally think it would be cool to see Hellion on the Hellions, but I don't know if he's like messed up enough to be on the Hellions. Number 7, Mercury. Mercury is another mutant to come from the bunch that Hellion was a part of. Julian was actually her first friend that she made when she arrived at the Savior Institute. Mercury's, or Cecily Kincaid's, parents had sent their daughter there after her powers first manifested, ashamed that she was a mutant. Eventually they would actually end up disowning her after they themselves were pulled into a mutant conflict. Mercury's powers allow her to turn her skin into liquid metal, which she can then control, reform, and use to shape shift with. This form is of course made up of non-toxic mercury, which is where she gets her code name from. Mercury was also one of the few mutants to keep her powers following the events of M Day. In fact, I have quite a few of those on my list. Not all of them, but a few of them. Number 6, 
Darwin. Darwin has some of the coolest abilities, and yet he isn't often easily recognized as being one of the main members of the X-Men, even though he's been a part of the team for quite some time in the comics. For a long time, he was actually stuck bonded to Vulcan as he was part of one of the first teams of X-Men Xavier and Moira ever had. I don't know if we called that team the X-Men, but they're basically like another squad of X-Men in my mind. So He was part of the first team sent in to rescue the X-Men from Krakoa. Though we wouldn't find out about that team in terms of comic book history until many years after the events of the X-Men's printed fight against the mutant Living Island. Darwin's powers allow him to evolve as needed to ensure his survival. This basically makes him almost immortal as he can evolve to resolve almost any life threatening situation. Recently in the current X-Men run in issue number 5, this is why Darwin was chosen to be one of the team members to be sent into the vault after Serafina, as it wasn't known how long the team sent in would be locked within that place where time moves more quickly in comparison to Earth. I feel like they also just came out recently. But I haven't read that issue yet, so no spoilers. Kicking off the list, number 10, Zombie She-Hulk. First appearing in Marvel Zombies Dead Days, issue number one back in 2007, the story takes place on Earth 2149 after a zombie plague, which you may have guessed by now just based off the name. Now this comic is super dark and gory. The zombie runs give us a fun variation of the Avengers, especially Jen Walters. See, when Jen first arrived at the Avengers mansion after the Avengers Assemble call, she was shocked to find that Earth's mightiest heroes have become Earth's munchiest heroes, no thanks to a plague. Now it wasn't long at all before Jen herself was zombified and then she got this fantastic appetite. Yeah, she took a bite or six out of Franklin Richards and his sister Valeria. So you can imagine the look on the Fantastic Four's face when they returned. They weren't too jazzed, especially Sue Storm. And before we go on with this list of incredible Hulks, guys, if you want to go ahead and Hulk smash that like button, that would be great. It really goes a long way for our channel here. You guys are the best. Thank you so much. Now let's get right back to this list. Number nine, Venom Hulk. Okay, this next one isn't around too long in the comics, but Maybe that's a good thing. Venom Hulk is terrifying, and it all goes down to the 1989 What If series, issue four. It shows us what exactly would happen if the alien costume had possessed Spider-Man. It's a pretty scary alternative to if the Fantastic Four hadn't been able to separate Peter and the suit originally. Now it gets ugly pretty quickly and the other Avengers are called upon to try and stop Peter from causing irreversible damage. Doctor Strange hurls spells at him for hours and it's still no use. Now it's no surprise that when the Hulk comes in to start smashing, the symbiote sees his power and it wants that power. It's like, well, this guy's pretty jacked. And then when it comes into contact with the Hulk, this behemoth is born. So finally, Thor comes around to hopefully try and end this disaster of a situation. But he's greeted by a creature containing the powers of both Spider-Man and the Hulk. Good game, guys. Number eight, Captain Universe Hulk. This one is short and sweet. Captain Universe isn't a person, per se, despite how the name sounds. It's the uni power, which is an aspect of the Enigma Force. It's a manifestation of the universe itself. It's sentient, and it's on the hunt for whoever is in ultimate danger. It bonds with them. And after we just heard with Venom Hulk, it's safe to say that we're in for another bonding treat of some sorts. The unit power has bonded with Daredevil X-23, and when Banner accidentally steps on a bear trap in Captain Universe in the Hulk issue one, he bonds with the uni power in order to survive the cold and dangerous landscapes. Imagine just stepping on a bear trap and all of a sudden it's like, I'm the unit power, you need me, trust me. You're like, oh, this day sucks. Number seven, Lizard Hulk. Lizard Hulk is so much fun. Okay, let's talk about it. He comes from Earth 19919. His name is Robert Banner, and he of course has a similar origin that we're most familiar with when it comes to the Hulk. Only he was infected by the spider virus in Spider Island issue one, released back in 2015. So now he's the Hulk, but he's got extra arms, and that means he's even more powerful. How wonderful. The Spider Queen is standing tall over Manhattan with the residents of New York City turning into spiders so for our heroes, it's probably best to be switched to a different animal's DNA, you know, to avoid the whole mind control spider queen situation. So Captain America gets a hairy upgrade and then the Hulk gets paired with some lizard DNA, resulting in a weird but exciting showdown. It's like Godzilla meets Ganon meets Bruce Banner. It's just a hot mess. Number six, Nerd Hulk, AKA Robert Banner. He made his first appearance in the Ultimates with Avengers issue three. Nerd Hulk sounds like a version of the Hulk that we saw from Endgame, but there's more to it. See, this Hulk is actually referred to as Vampire King, which sounds interesting, but I'll get to that in a second. So he was a clone originally created by Stark's older brother, Gregory Stark. Now the clone has all the smarts and it has the Hulk's strength, but it lacked the anger, which Captain America wasn't really a fan of. See, Cap was also able to take him down easily, so it's clear you need to have anger in order to be the Hulk. 
completely. So when Nerd Hulk is set to take on Red Skull, he's actually able to crush the Cosmic Cube. Only this was an illusion and the Red Skull was able to blast Nerd Hulk away. So now we need an upgrade. We need to change something up. We can't have the Hulk just getting blasted away every time there's a mission. We needed some anger in there so our clone Robert can pull his weight, literally. So he wasn't active for a while after this point. He was even denied when he asked to rejoin the team after they took on Ghost Rider, or Robert. So he traveled to New York City where there just happened to be a vampire outbreak. So now he's Team Edward, vampire and all. He's working for the vamp leader referred to as Anthony. So Banner ended up disagreeing with his leadership and took him out of the picture and he actually took his spot. So now Nerd Vampire Hulk was the new leader of the vampires, which is pretty sweet. Something we're probably not gonna get on screen, but it's nice to imagine. Number five. Kang. This guy we can actually look forward to knowing more about soon, as he's confirmed for the next Ant-Man sequel with actor Jonathan Majors set to play him. But just who is Kang the Conqueror? Why is this a big deal for the Avengers? Well, he made his first appearance in Avengers issue 8 back in 1964, and Kang has seen many, many centuries. His powers allow him to travel through time, and his futuristic suit of armor is built with weapons that can take on beings from any of those timelines. He's super smart and of course travels with armies, with each warrior equipped with the same armor and weaponry, so the fights aren't exactly easy by any means. The time travel stuff also doesn't come without consequence either. See, as Kang travels more and more through time, he creates time-displaced duplicates. And with the cosmic multiversal route that Marvel's going with now in the MCU, and especially with Loki's show, we can probably look forward to some more mind-bending battles. Number four, Taskmaster. Taskmaster made his first comic book debut in Avengers 195. Anthony Masters is a former S.H.I.E.L.D. agent, of course, who turned into a mercenary and assassin. Although he is one guy, he has this ability where he can copy your every move. So he can replicate your physical skills. He has photographic reflexes, so he can watch Black Widow take down an evil henchman, and bam, he's got it locked into his brain. He knows how to do the same type of combat as well. He's actually the villain of the Black Widow movie, but that has yet to come out due to COVID delays, so the general public doesn't really know how cool this guy is yet. He became a teacher based out of the Taskmaster's Academy to train villains and agents, one of those agents being US agent John Walker, who is currently turning heads for all the wrong reasons in Falcon and the Winter Soldier. Now in the comics, it was actually Taskmaster who taught Walker how to throw Cap's shield so well. In Avengers issue 196, he was able to capture Yellow Jacket, the Wasp, and Ant-Man, and then when the rest of the team showed up, he took them on as well only being defeated because he cannot predict the movements of the robot Jocasta. Otherwise, it's a tough battle, this one for sure. Number three, Mephisto. While on the topic of characters that we wanted to see in the MCU, I of course gotta talk about the devil himself. He made his first appearance as a serpent in Bible Tales for Young Folk issue one, but he made his first full appearance as Mephisto in Silver Surfer issue three. I don't think I have to explain too much about this guy or why he's a threat. I mean, he's Satan. He's the literal devil of the Marvel universe. He lives comfortably in hell with lesser demons that serve him. The reason we thought we were gonna get Mephisto in WandaVision goes back to something he did in the comics, which was kind of a big deal. The comic was Avengers West Coast Volume 2, Issue 52. We find out the truth behind Scarlet Witch's children, Billy and Tommy, who were in WandaVision. Now it turns out the five pieces of Pandemonium's soul were actually Mephisto. So Mephisto tricked Pandemonium and gathered beings possessing the appropriate fragments, and two of those five fragments just happen to be children of the Scarlet Witch and the Vision. So when Pandemonium arrived, he took the kids, which in turn gave Mephisto full strength, and this left Scarlet Witch having a breakdown. Mephisto's awesome. His deals are always crazy. Like after the comic Civil War, when everybody knew Spider-Man's identity, Spider-Man had to make a deal with Mephisto in order to save Aunt May because she got shot because he revealed his name to the public. So he's pretty wild. That's just one of many, many horrible deals. Number two, MODOK. Making its first appearance in Tales of Suspense issue 93, MODOK was created by Dr. George Tarleton. He had worked with the team recently to create the Cosmic Cube, but the scientist supreme, Lyle Getz, figured the next logical step was figuring out a way to understand the powers inside said cube. So enter Project MODOK spelt with a C at the end, not a K, that's important. So MODOK stood for Mental Organism Designed Only for Computing. Sounds like the perfect tool to analyze and probe this cosmic cube. So they grabbed that scientist George that I mentioned and altered him into this big headed supercomputer. With a brain too big for his body, they had to give him a hover chair, which is referred to as the doomsday chair. I mean, he's already a villain. You guys are just kind of making this happen for him. The scientists did not prepare that with great power comes great superiority. So it wasn't long before MODOK overtook his masters, changed that last letter from a C to a K, making his new more suitable name for the list, MODOK. 
which stood for a mental organism designed only for killing. He's the big bad villain in the new Avengers PS4 game, and he's as crazy as it sounds in that game as well. And finally, number one, Morgan Le Fay. Now, with the Marvel Cinematic Universe leaning into the witch madness for the conclusion of WandaVision, we might actually get to see Morgan Le Fay on the big screen soon enough. She made her first appearance in Black Knight issue one back in 1955, and she's been a recurring villain to the Avengers in the comics for a while now. And when the Dark Avengers were formed by Norman Osborn, Morgan was their first enemy to face off against. She's a powerful spellcaster, one of those spells being reality warping by using these Norn stones. So she packs a punch. Elizabeth Hurley actually plays Morgan Le Fay in the show Runaways, and she's great when it comes to these witchy devilish roles. I mean, she literally played the devil in the movie Bedazzled as well, which is pretty funny. She was made for the role, it seems. Halfway through into number five, Shadow Knight. Shadow Knight's real name is Randall Spector, Mark's younger brother. He was envious of Mark his entire life, which turned him into a horrible criminal. There was a murderer on the streets killing nurses called the Hatchet Man, so Moon Knight used his girlfriend Marlene as like bait to catch the killer. The plan worked, but Marlene perished. Yeah. And to make matters even worse, the Hatchet Man was revealed to be Randall. Randall later joined the cult of Khonshu, which ultimately resulted in him receiving the same powers as his brother Mark. However, he ended up choosing to use them for evil, donning the pseudonym Shadow Knight. Because, you know, every character needs to have a reverse version of themselves. Reverse Flash, Dark Archer, Bizarro. It was devastating for Mark to fight his brother and ultimately kill him by slitting his throat with a throwing crescent. Yeah, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't get much worse than that, especially when you learn that Mark tried protecting Randall their entire lives. But then again, he killed your girlfriend, so... In it for Midnight Man. Originally a collector of art, Anton Mogart would commit robberies at the stroke of midnight to build his collection. When Moon Knight stops him, he seemingly drowns in a river, but instead, he ends up becoming deformed by the waste found within the sewers. Then he goes insane and starts collecting trash, and teams with Bushman to defeat their sworn enemy. When Midnight Man finds out he's dying from cancer, he decides to find his son, hoping that he can share some of his final moments with him. Mogart does what he can to stop his son from turning to a life of crime like he once did, and in the wake of his death, he becomes the hero Midnight. It didn't last, and he ended up becoming a cyborg for the Secret Empire. Which, while sounding bad, I think it would be kinda cool, like, to be a cyborg. Like, as long as I still have, like, my free will, and my programming isn't controlling me, because that just doesn't sound like fun. Like, I want to be able to turn my arm into a giant cannon. That'd be great. Someone tries to mug me, I'm just like, sorry. <laughs> Getting close to the end in number three, Seth Falcon. He belongs to a Scottish sect of Knights Templar and has several amazing powers. I'll never do that accent again. Falcon first appeared in Mark Spector Moon Knight number 43. Seth Falcon is immortal, has superhuman strength and stamina, but his strongest power is his touch. Using his clawed fingers, Falcon can drain the life force out of any living being, aging them in the process. If he holds his grip for long enough, Seth can drain the, the entire life out of somebody, all of it, turning them into a rotted skeleton. However, there's a catch. Due to feedback, the draining process backfires if Seth uses it on anybody who shares his DNA code, even partially. Simply put, he can't drain his relatives because it causes the mm, series of issues that then hurts and weakens his powers. And yep, that's right. You guessed it. Of course, Moon Knight turns out to be one of his long lost relatives. So Falcon has to rely on his superhuman strength and stamina to outlast Mark Spector in any mutual fight. Which is good, because that kind of like levels the playing field. Penultimately, in at number two, Cactus. Sometimes a name is just a name. It could have meaning or it could just be something cool that the guy thought of that ended up kind of making sense. Other times, names are extremely direct and are probably too on point. That's the case with Cactus, who is exactly what he sounds like and nothing more. Created by Dominus, he's been a villain of the West Coast Avengers and Moon Knight on various occasions. Punching him definitely stings, but beyond that, it, it doesn't take all that much to, to, to break him. Or chop him up, because, you know, he's a cactus. Which has actually happened before, though he can regenerate lost limbs. Which I don't know if cactuses can do, or cacti can do, but... Yeah, he's without a doubt one of the lamest villains in the Marvel Universe, but in my opinion, that makes him one of the coolest. This guy is literally a cactus, and that's hilarious. A couple years ago, the girl I was with at the time and I came up with a superhero that we called Cact Guy, who was basically in essence Cactus. 
and we didn't know that it was actually a thing. But it's funny to me that someone actually made this and then put it in the goddamn Marvel Universe. That's hilarious. That's amazing. And Cactus is my new favorite villain ever because of that. Cacti hashtag Cactus in the MCU. And finally, in the number one, Hunter's Moon. Dr. Batter was born in Luxor, Egypt to two doctors and was an excellent student throughout his life, eventually becoming a doctor as well. He grew to become a very rational and serious person who didn't believe in any higher entities, despite still attending prayer and studying the Quran and the Hadith. This all changed when he was attacked by vampires and left to die on the streets, at which point he met the Egyptian moon god Khonshu. Dr. Batter survived and became a worshipper of Khonshu, who fancied himself the god's second highest priest, and opposite of Mark's Spectre. After learning that Moon Knight had taken in vampires under his protection, Dr. Batter terrorized the Nightwalkers to get his attention. Hunter's Moon eventually confronted Moon Knight, chastised him for taking in enemies of Khonshu, and expressed his intentions to correct him. Dr. Batter beat Moon Knight and invaded the Midnight Mission to kill the vampires, but Spectre recovered and knocked him unconscious after attacking him from behind. Which you know what, after beating him, I'm not even gonna call it, that's kinda shady. I respect it. Number 5. Valknar the Exhumer Thanks to Eternals and Guardians of the Galaxy from the MCU, the Celestials have become a more common Marvel God group, something that you can throw around at a party with a bunch of people that, you know, haven't read all the comics and they'll be like, I know who the Celestials are. Sweet. The Celestials are the one who created the Eternals and, in essence, in the MCU, use them to birth new Celestials. Celestials are creators of life, but tragically, worlds kind of have to be sacrificed in the MCU in order to create Celestials and incubate them. Earth was at one point one of the worlds threatened by the birth of a new Celestial, but in the MCU, the Eternals banded together to prevent Earth's destruction, managing to turn the waking Celestial into marble before it could basically rise up. However, in the comics, the dark truth the Eternals learn is that in reality, the Celestials actually plan to cultivate and then harvest humanity and Earth to use in their battle against the corrupted Dark Celestials and the Horde, which threatened both the Celestials and basically the universe. Where the Celestials are inherently seen as neutral or sometimes a good force, the Dark Celestials are pure evil and really only seek to awaken the Horde and to just destroy stuff. Volknar the Exhumer was no exception and was a member of the final host of the Dark Celestials. Volknar, with the others of his group, attempted to attack and destroy Earth, but Iron Man banded together with the Avengers after learning the secrets of the Uni Mind. Because at that point, the Eternals were gone. Creating a Uni Mind and banding together with the Celestials, Earth was able to fight back and defeat Volknar and their brethren. By Dark Celestials. Except not really, because, you know, you can't. Celestials are hard to destroy, destroy, but you can stop them if you try really hard and you believe, and you create a uni mind. Number four, Eternity. When it comes to the main comic book continuity of Earth 616, Basically, that's what Eternity is. Well, Eternity and his sister Infinity, kind of. Together, they embody the 616 universe. Eternity is also an abstract entity that represents time as well, making them pretty epically powerful. There are some that usurp them when it comes to their power levels, but those beings would usually be more on a multiversal level, on a whole other level of just powerful, because there's the universe and then there's the multiverse, baby. Eternity has been stated to be above all other abstract entities in the 616 universe, including Mistress Death, Master Order, and Lord Chaos. Within the realm of 616, there is almost no power too great for them to possess as the embodiment of that universe. They can easily manipulate it and bend it to their will as they see fit. Cause I mean, they are it, so yeah. Number three, the Living Tribunal. The Living Tribunal basically represents the justice of the multiverse. They are one of the most powerful beings and entities in the entire multiverse. Though obviously aren't at the top of the food chain when it comes to our most powerful but lesser known gods of the Marvel Universe and multiverse. The Living Tribunal only has one form, but is in essence a constant and can exist across multiple realities at the same time. However, any alternates seen in this way are really just one entity, therefore not alternates, because the Living Tribunal is able to be at multiple places at once. As I said, they can exist. There can be multiple versions, but it's really just one. You know what I mean? It's an OP trait. 
I would love to be able to do that, to just have me and be as I am, but then have multiple versions of me, cross realities. Think of how much work I could get done. The Living Tribunal, in essence, represents the Marvel multiverse and exists to uphold its integrity and stability, working as the force of justice within the multiverse. The Living Tribunal also has power levels that are off the charts, and at one point, a version of Adam Warlock took the place of this powerful entity after the Living Tribunal died, becoming the new Living Tribunal. Adam Warlock, Living Tribunal, here to do the job. There are lots of Adam Warlocks across the multiverse. Number two, the one below all. I mean, it's really hard to say between these top two points, who's really the more powerful between them, because they're kind of like different sides of the same coin. But this is what I decided to go with. If you disagree, you can let me know in the comments. I'm cool with that. We can have a debate. It'll be fun. I'm definitely giving away my number one spot, by the way, if you are deep in the god mythos of Marvel. But if you are, good for you. And also, thanks for still watching this video just to see what little old me thinks about these gods and their rankings. I think you're neat. The one below all is basically the real Satan or devil of the Marvel Universe. I know that Mephisto, Azazel, and Damon Hellstrom's father have all kind of claimed to be like the one and only devil, but really that title most truly belongs to the one below all. They are the dark side of the multiverse's creator, and as such, are also an all-powerful, omnipotent, omniscient, multiversal entity and being. Although where the other half is more broad when it comes to, you know, their focus, the one below all is pretty niche. They basically rule over gamma mutates, being the source of mutagenic gamma energy, which is still super cool. It's just, that's kind of more their focus. They can possess and overtake gamma powered or mutated individuals and bend them to their will, making them not just powerful, but also a pretty scary uh, entity overall. And uh, if you want to learn more about that, you can check it out in Immortal Hulk, which if you haven't read it, you should read it because it's the best thing since sliced bread. Number one, the one above all. The one above all is so powerful, they don't even have their own designated universe. Instead, they exist in all of the universes, being a multiversal entity and constant. And yes, if you haven't already guessed, they are the other side of the coin when it comes to the one below all. In essence, the one above all is like the god of the Marvel comic book multiverse. They are the creator of all things, and despite the existence of many other gods and immortal constants, both good and bad, they exist pretty much above them all. The the one true power of the multiverse. They are seen to be an omnipotent and omniscient being who can do all and see all. It is believed that everything that exists in the multiverse was in fact ultimately created by them. Out of respect for the two major creative forces that started it all, the one above all has at times appeared to resemble both Jack Kirby and Stan Lee, often considered Marvel's founding fathers which I think is also super sweet and appropriate. Who would the one below all though be? <laughs> who's like, who's like the Satan of Marvel? Number five, Cypher. You know about Cypher, but do you know about Cypher? With an I not with a Y, just to be clear. Cypher is Elisa Tager and has powers similar to mutant Kitty Pride. That is, she can phase and even float or fly while in her phased state. She was part of the Jean School for Higher Learning and was initially discovered by mutant Cyclops, Jean Grey, and Zorn. Cypher also can turn herself invisible both visually and psychically. Well, almost completely invisible psychically, almost. Immensely powerful telepaths such as Jean Grey have still been shown as being able to sense her. Although Cypher has only made a few appearances appearances here and there in the comics, she still managed to make her way onto the young X-Men team and has even reappeared on Krakoa. Number 4, Ink. Ink is another member of the X-Men who technically isn't a mutant. It was believed initially that his mutant ability was to gain powers from his tattoos. However, it was later revealed that it was Eric Gitter, aka Ink's tattoo artist, who was the mutant and who basically imbued Eric with these powers using his own mutant ability. Ink's tattoo artist was Leon Nunez, a mutant with no code name really, simply being known by his name or known as the tattoo artist. Ink would be recruited as one of the young X-Men, initially believing he was working for Cyclops but later learning he was in fact working for a disguised Donald Pierce. Ink fought alongside his fellow X-Men, but would leave the team for a time later on after discovering that he wasn't truly a mutant when he found out where his powers really came from. When his fellow teammates needed his help, however, he would return armed with more tattoos from his artist. The Ten of Swords handbook listed him as an active member of the X-Men, so, you know, 
He's there, he could be back again. I don't know, I feel like I haven't seen Ink in a while, but he's out there. Number three, Slipstream. On my previous list, I talked about the mutant known as Lifeguard, but now it's time to focus on her brother, who is also a mutant, don't you know? Davis Cameron, AKA Slipstream. While his sister Heather worked as an actual lifeguard in Australia, Davis himself was a surfer. His powers weren't activated until later in his life and were actually awoken by Sage after his sister went missing and it was revealed his latent mutant abilities could be used to help find and then rescue her. Slipstream's abilities allow him to create quantum portals, which can transport him and any passengers he takes along with him across great distances. However, it should be noted, it requires a lot of concentration for him to bring others along with him. He can also track previous teleportations, allowing him to use these warp wave abilities to find his way to the destination and location of teleporters that he's tracking. Which I think is a pretty useful ability, tracking teleporters, because they're tricky. Number two, Spider Girl. Well, not naturally born, but kind of made in a lab. Spider Girl made a single appearance in Avenging Spider Man issue 16. She had similar powers to Spider Man, but was made of a combination of spider and mutant DNA by the Jackal, using materials found in Mr. Sinister's lab. Wow, the Jackal in Mr. Sinister's lab just sounds like such a dangerous thing. As such, she also had the additional powers to shapeshift into a giant spider with five human eyes. While in this shape, she also had the power to spit purple mucus and even fire optic blasts from her eyes. Makes you think there might be some Summers DNA mixed in there, which honestly, if we're talking about Mr. Sinister's lab, I wouldn't be surprised. She ended up rampaging across the city of New York after the Jackal released her as part of a test. Fortunately, she was apprehended by Superior Spider-Man and the X-Men, who explained that she seemed to be a mutant and ended up taking her in after defeating her. We never really heard anything about her after that. Spider-Girl was created by Christopher Yost and Paco Medina. Who knows, maybe we'll see her again, I don't know. Number one, Forget Me Not. Despite the fact that Forget Me Not is someone you definitely forget, you may have heard us talk about him on the channel before, because his powers are just so interesting. But for those who haven't heard of him or have simply forgotten him, <laughs> let's give you a little refresher course. Forget Me Not is an X-Men member whose mutant power is that no one can ever remember him. This makes it easier for him to basically infiltrate places, but it makes it harder for him to ever connect with anyone, make a friend, or even have his teammates remember that he's actually on the team. This is why Forget Me Not is also usually left off of the official rosters for the team and why you might never really see his name mentioned there, ever. Forget Me Not's psychic powers that enable him to go unnoticed and remain forgotten were actually so strong that even Professor Xavier struggled to remember him and, as it was revealed in X-Men Legacy issue 300, had to place within his mind a psychic hourly reminder just so he wouldn't forget permanently about Forget Me Not's existence. If you're wondering what happened to Forget Me Not in the end, he was forgotten. So, yeah. Number five, Blindfold. Blindfold is Ruth Aldine and is a possible descendant of Destiny. She was born without eyes entirely. Her mutant powers allow her to manipulate astral energy, tap into the astral plane, and grant her specific telepathic abilities, including precognition and clairvoyance. She also has the ability to manipulate chaos factors and alter events in order to achieve a desired result, and maintains a reality warp resistance. Pretty useful. She also has some telekinetic abilities as well. Much of her power was lost to her and she was in rough shape when she was admitted to the Xavier Institute. She had lost half her power and had her mind shattered by her brother. Blindfold had a really rough home life and her brother Luca ended up coming home one day filled with hate for his sister and prepared to kill her with a chainsaw. When her mother stepped in to defend her, her mother was instead murdered by Luca, who blamed young Ruth's freakishness for his own actions. Luca ended up getting the death penalty for this crime, but when he died, it seemed as though his own mutant abilities manifested, causing him to shift into an astral or ghost-like form and attack Ruth. Blindfold has a close connection to Legion and would later end up in a relationship with the son of Charles Xavier. Yay! I don't know why I'm celebrating that, but I just think it's kind of a cute romance, I guess. Number four, Triage. Triage was one of the mutants to appear after the dispersion of the Phoenix Force. Christopher Muse discovered his powers when a friend of his fell and hit her head while they were out dancing. 
It seemed as though she was dead until Christopher's touch seemed to heal and revive her, bringing her back to life. Eventually, he was apprehended by the police because of his miraculous healing ability, but would later be freed and recruited by the X-Men. He was one of the mutants who was captured and later killed by one using the X-Gene cure after he refused to use his healing powers to help them. Triage seems to have had eternal youth and immortality as a result of his powers in addition to being able to heal others and even reanimate the dead. Fortunately, since his death, he is one of the mutants that we have seen returned by the five on Krakoa, with him being spotted in the comics at Krakoan Hotspot, the Green Lagoon. Number 3. Dark Wind X-Men teammates really do come in all shapes and sizes. Coming to us from Asgard, we have Danny Moonstar's mighty steed, Brightwind. Remember when Danny joined the Valkyroar after she lost her powers following M-Day? Yeah, it was during that time that she met and bonded with Brightwind. After leaving Asgard and returning to Earth, Brightwind came with her, but instead became known as Darkwind on Earth. So that's why I said Darkwind at the beginning of this point. By extension, he became a member of the X-Men and New Mutants along with Danny. Cute. Number 2. Ariel Ariel is an alien from the planet known as the Coconut Grove. Her mutant power is persuasion, but due to her alien physiology, she can also teleport. Ariel herself is also related to another Ariel who visited Earth and inspired the character of the same name from William Shakespeare's play, The Tempest. There's a lot of Tempest references in my list today. Ariel, the one we're focusing on with this point, not her ancestor, also ended up on Earth after being sent there on a mission to collect samples from the mutants of Earth for her people to study. They themselves had reached an evolutionary standstill as such and were curious about the Earth mutants and their evolutionary process. It was during her time on Earth that she would meet up with and join the Fallen Angels, and later on in San Francisco would end up meeting the X-Men team and joining them for a time. Number 1. Sunpire You know Sunfire, but do you know Sunpire? Sunpire was Shiro Yoshida's younger sister, Leu. She also had powers and an attitude similar to her brothers, and first appeared in Uncanny X-Men issue 392 in 2001. For those unfamiliar with Sunfire's or Sunpire's abilities, both siblings possess the mutant ability of Solar Flare, which allows them to absorb solar radiation and convert it into superheated plasma. Using this ability, they could both cover their body in flame as they became like a flying, human-shaped sun. Sunpire can use her power to emit plasma blasts and give off intense solar heat. Leia is one of the mutants who answered a psychic call to help defeat Magneto and save Professor X. After helping out the X-Men in that adventure, she'd later appear again as a member of the X-Corps. It is believed she died in action when the other members of X-Corps turned on her because mastermind Martinique Wingard, working in league with Mystique, was controlling them. Number 5. Spiral Spiral has been an enemy of the X-Men, but would also become a member member of Storm and Psylocke's X-Force team. She was a human known as Rita Hayward, who would end up in the Mojoverse and become part of a time paradox, having been attacked by her future mutated self, Spiral. Originally, she was a stunt woman who ended up falling in love with Longshot during his time on Earth and returned with him to the Mojoverse. When his plan to defeat Mojo failed, Rita was captured and was modified by Mojo to have six arms, one of which was completely cybernetic. Spiral herself is part cyborg, part human mutate as a result of the modifications performed on her. She was also the one responsible acting as an agent of Mojo for giving Psylocke her cybernetic eyes. True facts. Number 4. Shark Girl Seriously, Wolverine and the X-Men has such a fun group of characters in it. If you haven't checked it out, you need to check it out. Ayara Dos Santos is one of that group. She first appeared in issue 20 of the series and has also been referred to as Were Shark before, which is pretty fitting. As both names would imply, she is basically part shark, part human, and that's also her mutation. Shark Girl is one of the mutants who appeared following the dispersion of the Phoenix Force. When her powers first manifested, both the Brotherhood and the X-Men attempted to recruit her to their causes. She refused both offers and was later kidnapped by Mystique, who attempted to then recruit her using force, basically. Fortunately, she was saved by Angel and would eventually agree to attend the Jean Grey School of Higher Learning. Shark Girl can transform into a full shark and can also transform into a part shark, part human, basically like a land shark. While in these forms, she can survive either underwater or on land and has enhanced strength, 
stamina, and speed. Number three, Adam X. We are going back to the crazy Summers family tree for this one. Adam X is the half brother of Cyclops, Havoc, and Vulcan. His mother is Catherine Summers, but his father was the emperor of the Shi'ar Empire, Emperor Diken Naramani. Adam X first came on the scene in the 90s, and to hear his story, you'd easily be able to peg him as a 90s character. Trust. He was abducted when he was just a baby from the genetic lab in which he was created by Jonath, who became his adoptive father and raised him. Growing up, his mutant powers would manifest, which allowed him to basically set others' blood on fire, burning them from the inside out, which already sounds like such a 90s power in my mind. He can also ignite his own blood, which is a very painful, but grants him a speed boost. Adam would then learn that he was a hybrid being, part Shi'ar, part mutant. Number two, Petra. Petra has the ability to manipulate rocks and rock formations. She can cause earthquakes and even use her powers to create diamonds. In fights, she can bind her opponents or completely destroy them by having the earth move to swallow them. And she can transform rocks into different kinds of weapons and wield them against her opponents, setting them hurtling towards them. Petra was recruited by Moira McTaggart after being apprehended by the police. Her family died in a rock slide when she was young, which to this day Petra actually wonders if she caused. Following that, she was moved into the foster care system, but after her adoptive father attempted to assault her, she used her powers to escape him and became a runaway. She discovered her ability to turn coal into diamonds, and she would later exchange these diamonds for a place to sleep, but eventually this kind of drew suspicion, and she was later tracked down and then taken in by the police. Fortunately, Moira arranged for her to be released, and then of course offered her a place as part of her team. Number one, Sway. I love Sway. Her powers are just so cool and her origin is so tragic. I feel so bad for Sway, but I'm also like, these powers are awesome. I love the way that they're phrased. I love the way that they're used. It's neat. Sway's powers manifested when she was just a teenager. While visiting New York City in preparation for college, Suzanne's parents and herself ended up in the wrong place at the wrong time, and they were gunned down during an attack that was basically part of a gang war. While Suzanne's parents were killed in the attack, she miraculously survived due to the manifestation of her powers, which allowed her to manipulate the flow of time. She had instinctively stopped the bullets that would have hit her in midair, but she didn't have the experience or the understanding yet required to save her parents. Sway's powers allow her to control and manipulate time in her nearby vicinity. She can also rewind the temporal memory of a location, allowing her to basically review past events. It was using her powers that she was able to track down her parents' killers and report them to the police, helping them to apprehend those criminals. And revealing her abilities to the officers, she was basically put in contact with Moira McTaggart and then of course ended up joining up with the X-Men. And that's also how Petra, Sway, and Vulcan all know each other. In case you read any of the new stuff and been like, who are these? Who are these ladies? If you missed Deadly Genesis. Who are some of your favorite lesser known X-Men members? Which team members would you like to see return to prominence? Are there any villains who you'd love to see join the core team now that everyone is mostly getting along, mostly, on Krakoa? Let us know in the comments below. And speaking of comments, it's time to turn to some comments from one of our latest videos, Top 10 X-Men Members You've Never Heard of Part 3. Gavin Darth comments, I can see Miss McKnight being able to use the abilities of Rogue and the Phoenix. Wow, that basically means I'm super powerful in your mind, so thank you. I'm gonna take that as a huge compliment. Also, I love Rogue and I love the Phoenix, so. Yeah. Zach Blackwood shares, I used to create so many of my own X-Men names, powers, and backstories. Wish I gotta share them. Well, I have two words for you, my friend. Fan fiction. Just write your own stories, and hey, you never know, maybe Marvel will catch an eye to those. You never know what could happen in the long run. Write it down, that's what I say. Corey responds, love the Charlie XCX sweatshirt. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for noticing that that sweatshirt was Charlie XCX that I was wearing in that video. Every time I wear that, that click, sweater, no one ever knows that it's Charlie XCX, so thank you. Number five, Trance. Trance is another mutant who is affiliated with the X-Men and even tried out to become an X-Men in training under Emma Frost, following the events of House of M. She was one of the lucky few, or unlucky few, I guess depending on your perspective, to remain powered. Hope Abbott, or Trance, possesses the power to leave her physical body, becoming ghost-like in appearance on panel, but in reality, she's just astral projecting. In other words, she's not as powerful as some other mutants who are able to astral project as, you know, 
part of their larger set of powers, generally being telepathic or telekinetic in origin. But hey, not everyone can astral project, so I still think this is pretty cool. I also like when people don't have like crazy awesome powerful things and then you still have to see them like try to figure out how do I use this in a way that's cool and you know, good, so I can be on the same level. I think that's cooler to read, but that's just me. Number four, Stacey X. Although Stacey X hasn't made a ton of appearances, she is a memorable character due to her uh, interesting and sensual abilities. Former abilities, I guess I should say. We don't really know if she has been returned to the status of a mutant, but we do know that she has joined the mutant nation of Krakoa now. So, considering that when we last saw her, she was missing those abilities that she used to have in her former appearance, I assume that she has participated in the Crucible, was killed by the mutant formerly known as Apocalypse, and has been resurrected as her former self. But also, there are a lot of people in line to just be returned to us, and I'm sure there's a lot of people in line to participate in the Crucible to earn their power. Hours back, so who knows? Who knows where she is in that that long, long line? Also, Apocalypse is no longer on the island following the events of Ten of Swords, so there is that. I don't know who's running the Crucible now. Who is like the replacement apocalypse. Stacey X was part of the X-Men for a brief period after being rescued by them from her place of work, which was attacked and destroyed by the Church of Humanity. Stacey X used her powers at her place of employment to help make clients who came through feel good and grant them sensations of pleasure. She can also use her pheromone powers in combat to make her opponents feel not so good, manipulating their bodily functions. She makes you feel sick. Blech. Number three, Loa. Loa is one of the resurrected mutants to rejoin us on Krakoa, reborn again. While you may not know her as well as some of the others, she has a long and storied past with both the X-Men, her fellow mutants, good pals Rockslide and Match, and even with Namor. In fact, Namor was the one who came to save the day after she first discovered her powers. Loa's abilities allow her to pass through other matter and in so doing, destroy it on a molecular level. She discovered she had these powers when her dad was attacked by a shark while well, they were surfing together and she passed through it, destroying it. Namor would later come to her and her father's rescue before the situation could escalate, and it was later revealed that her grandmother was actually an old friend of Namor's. Since then, she also gained the ability to breathe underwater after being exposed to the Atlantean amulet. The amulet also allows Loa's physiology to adapt so that she can survive in the depths of the ocean easily. Number two, match. You might know the Pyros, but do you know Match? Match is Ben Hamill, one of the mutants to appear in the new X-Men series, but making his first appearance in New Mutants. His powers are Pyrokinesis, hence his name. It basically gives him control over fire, which he himself can generate, and also helps to make him immune to fire attacks and heat. Match is now not as hot on the radar, but was for a time the leader of the X-Men adjacent team, the Paragon Squad. He also participated in a competition for a place on Emma Frost's X-Men team, and has attended both the Xavier Institute and the Jean Grey School for Higher Learning. I'm not sure if it's of or for, because of feels weird to me, but I think it is right. It's of or for, it's one of those. Number one, Lifeguard. Lifeguard is Heather Cameron, a mutant who, as a response to life-threatening danger, gains the skills and powers necessary to save those lives around her. This power, or powers, not only works for her in regards to saving others, but also is a reactive power that applies to saving her own life, meaning she can get out of pretty much almost any kind of dangerous situation that she puts herself in. Before Lifeguard was her codename, it was actually her profession, as she worked as a lifeguard in Australia where she lived with her brother Davis. Eventually it was also implied in the comics that she has unknown Shi'ar heritage. We've seen her resurface in Dawn of X, popping up in Krakoa at the Green Lagoon Bar. But it would also be super cool to see her play more of a prominent role at some point in the comics, as her powers are pretty neat and definitely super useful. But maybe too powerful? Maybe that's why we haven't seen her as much. Like like hope. Number five, Betty Ross, She-Hulk. While Jen Walters is known as the badass lawyer cousin of Bruce who also likes to get big and green and punchy, Betty Ross has also held the mantle of one of Earth's mightiest. Coming again from the Ultimate Universe, Earth 1610, Betty Ross made her first appearance in Ultimates Issue 3, and she's the daughter of General Ross, and she was actually roommates with Janet Van Dyne in college. So Janet started seeing Hank Pym, you know, that guy who's not the best at all, and then Betty started to date Bruce Banner. Now, as she watched Banner turn into the Hulk and smash things around, 
She actually grew to like him even more. Maybe she's into the bad boys, who knows? And then later on, Bruce had been out on trial and given the death sentence, you know, being the Hulk and all. He got into some trouble and she was just devastated. So at this point, Jennifer Walters comes into the picture, but not as another version of the Hulk, not as She-Hulk. No, she comes in because she cracked the code on the serum at this point. She figured it out. So Betty lied to Nick Fury and said that Jennifer Walters was actually planning on selling that serum, but really she was just pirating the new Star Trek early. Which isn't nearly as bad as selling a super serum. So Betty herself ended up injecting the serum right before jumping out of a shield jet, and then she landed on the ground, and now she announced that she is plan B. We love a cool superhero entrance. So Betty fought Wolverine and actually managed to gouge his eyes out, which, you know, not too shabby. Wolverine ended up winning in the long run, so now Betty is forced to wear a necklace that would choke her if she turned bigger and turned into the Hulk. Some of these stories are fun, some of them are just tragic. Betty's story is mostly tragic in this sense. Number four, Red Hulk. He made his first appearance in The Incredible Hulk issue one as General Ross, but come the first issue of volume two, Ross goes beast mode. He becomes one of the Hulk's greatest threats. He becomes the Red Hulk. Now, Red Hulk was created using gamma radiation, just like our Hulk, but what makes him even more of a menace is the fact that he also has cosmic rays added to that aggressive mix. Now, the Red Hulk doesn't get stronger the anger he gets like Bruce does. He actually gets hotter. He physically gets hotter. He starts to burn up. During one of their first run-ins with the Red Hulk, when the two Goliaths were battling it out, the sand around them while they were fighting actually turned into glass. That's how hot the Red Hulk had gotten. And when there's more glass, that just means there's more things to break. Number three, The End Hulk. Written by Peter David, The Incredible Hulk The End shows us what Bruce Banner would look like after the rest of the world had fallen. So what happens when Bruce is the last thing alive, no thanks to his superpower? Well, in a one-shot released in 2002, we get the answer to that question. So after the events of this big nuclear fallout, Banner was the only person left alive, and the story opens up with Banner talking to just a vidbot, this floating camera that's always hovering 10 feet away from him. It's like the world's saddest vlog squad. It had found Banner when it was in the middle of confirming the eradication of humans. So now it follows him around forever, just waiting to see what happens. So Banner and the Hulk are on different levels at this point. The Hulk still wants to be a badass and fight things, but Bruce is done, he's tapped out. He looks around him and he sees giant mutated cockroaches like, ew, he doesn't want anything to do with this planet anymore. He's done. He doesn't want to be alive anymore. But the Hulk, number two, Infernal Hulk. In an alternate reality where Bruce Banner and the Hulk had separated, yes, it happens quite often, Bruce ended up becoming the new Sorcerer Supreme, which sounds like the improvement of a lifetime, but it's kind of not. And as for the Hulk side, oh, he gets cast into hell. God, just you right down below. Not as bright and optimistic, that's for sure. He makes his mark in Deadpool Annual Issue 1, and when the Hulk spends enough time in hell, he's bound to change, and I mean probably for the worse. He becomes the Infernal Hulk, and when Spider-Man and normal green version of Banner come from a parallel universe, the only way he's defeated is when he's tricked to destroy the Eye of Agamotto, which in turn banishes him back down to the underworld. So he's just destined for hell at this point. And finally, number one, Jill Fixit, Grey Hulk. Back in the day, Stan Lee actually wanted the Hulk to be grey, but due to ink and production problems, it ended up turning out green. Luckily, I mean, that's all we're used to now. Imagine if this guy was grey this whole time. That'd be kind of weird. So our first look back in 1962 at the Hulk was actually this gray version. Now it was explained in the comics that basically because of Bruce Banner's repetitive use of the gamma radiation projectors, the character's skin went from being gray to green. So it made sense in the story. Now the gray Hulk and the green Hulk are pretty much battling each other in Banner's mind. So they give the Grey Hulk a different identity now by referring to him as Joe Fixit, this tough, big, bad security guard who works at a casino in Las Vegas. Now, Grey Hulk doesn't get mad as fast. He's actually pretty intelligent and quite manipulative, which makes him even more of a threat. Now, the Grey Hulk would often come out at night, and then he'd go back to normal by dawn, which is just a nightmare. Imagine seeing this guy in the middle of the night, you're just walking to your car, and you're like, is that the Hulk? Why is he wearing a suit? Why is he shuffling cards? What is this dude? There have been rumors that the Grey Hulk will make an appearance in the She-Hulk Disney Plus show. I mean, we saw Grey Vision, so now a Grey Hulk? Huh, how lucky are we? Too soon. That one felt like it was too soon.